In there, good. Okay, so welcome everybody. I want to start this amazing chat to this evening. First off, thank you guys for joining us. Um, it means so much that you guys care about lemurs as much as we do to want to join in on our conservation chat and on World Lemur Day. I love our, uh, our world days because it really shines light on specific species that gives us an opportunity to highlight them. Uh, and a lot of species out there are endangered, are threatened, are critically endangered, like some of the species we are gonna be hearing about tonight. So first off, my name is Jed Dodds from the Reed Park Zoo. And um, again, thank you guys for joining us. I've had the honor and pr privilege of being a part of Reed Park Zoo for over 15 years now. And I've been in several different departments from being a zookeeper to an educator, uh, to now doing a lot of our development and donor stuff. And people always ask me, well, why? Why are you there? What, what, is, what, what do you want to achieve? And I tell them that my goal is to end extinction. And they sit there and look at me with wide eyes and say, how do you do that? And I say, well, I don't know, but we do it one step at a time. Uh, we do it one visitor at a time. We do it one talk at a time, one chat at a time. Um, and by doing that, we can raise awareness about species from around the world that need our help. And they typically need our help because of us. Um, and so we have a huge opportunity to be able to learn, to be able to connect, and then to be able to turn around and use our voices, use our power uh, to be able to give back to those animals, to those species. So tonight is World, today is World Lemur Day. And tonight we've assembled an amazing group of professionals that are going to talk about lemurs again in the wild, a lot of science about lemurs and what's going on with them. And then we also have one of our zookeepers that works with our two species of lemurs that is gonna be talking about how do we care for lemurs in a zoo and how important that is for all of you guys to have an opportunity to come and see them because not all of us get the opportunity to travel to Madagascar, um, but we do have an opportunity to travel to our local zoo. Reed Park Zoo is an accredited zoo and we work with other accredited zoos throughout the United States and throughout the world. And again, our goal is to bring people in, to teach people about species, to connect them, and hopefully then to protect them, use that as protecting them in the wild. And so tonight, it is my honor to introduce our panel. Uh, I wanna start by introducing Dr. Stacy Teacott. Uh, Dr. Teacott, I'm gonna allow you to just give a little introduction about yourself. Sure, thanks, Jed. Um, I am an associate professor of anthropology in the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. And my specialization there is in biological anthropology. And really, I'm a primatologist. So I study non-human primates and sometimes dabble in studying people and dogs too. I also have, um, the Jed mentioned that I do research in Madagascar. So that's where I do my field work. And I also established a lab in the um, anthropology building called the Laboratory for the Evolutionary Endocrinology of Primates, or LEAP for short. And that's where we analyze a lot of the samples that we collect in Madagascar and extract, um, measure things like hormones. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Teacott. And now you talked about LEAP Laboratory here at the University of Arizona. I would like to bring in Dr. Hayes. Dr. Hayes, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Allie and I work in Stacy's lab and uh, she brings, she goes to Madagascar and brings the samples back to the lab and then I extract the hormones and that's what I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. And you have a big job and there are people that work with you. So we have um, one of your lab techs, lab assistants here, Erica. Erica, give, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Erica. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in anthropology from the U of A in December 2019, and now I work for Stacey's lab, and I get to help out Allie. All right, thank you, Erica. And then as I mentioned, we have uh, one of our zookeepers at the Reed Park Zoo, uh, Hannah. Hannah, introduce yourself. Thanks, Jed. Yeah, my name is Hannah, and I am one of the animal keepers here at Reed Park Zoo, but I also get to work with um, this wonderful group of professionals at LEAP uh, at the Laboratory of um, Evolutionary Endocrinology of Primates. So um, I have a really cool position to be able to do both. Thank you, Hannah. And our other uh, panelist that's on is Gail Brown. She's the Director of Development at Reed Park Zoo. And she's one of the ones that helped put this entire conservation chat together. So thank you, Gail, for everything that you do. And she's gonna be helping to answer some questions or just to respond to you guys 
in the chats. Uh, please do chat us up, ask some questions. We would love to hear from you and uh, what you're interested in. If you hear something that you would like a better explanation on or some more information, there's a lot to cover. Um, we're only gonna keep this to about an hour, 45 minutes with some questions and answers. We don't wanna take up your entire night, but if you do have a question about something, let us know. Uh, we can't see you, but we can hear from you. And then I will take a look at those chats and ask the corresponding panelists about what that information is. Uh, so again, thank you to all of our amazing professionals that are on here uh, for taking the time out to be able to come on and do this conservation chat that is so important for such an important species. Uh, Dr. Teacott, I wanna start with you and give you the opportunity to give everyone kind of a brief overview of what you do, where you do it, and about our amazing lemurs. Sure, just give me one second to share my screen. Technology, guys. I, I love that, um, I mean, typically we'll do these conservation chats at the zoo, but obviously with COVID, it has changed everything. So having an opportunity like this to be able to reach you guys, uh, wherever you are in the world is great. So and we're all learning the Zoom technology and being able to do the, you know, give us a, the best that we can with what we got here. So um, I'm gonna, it looks like uh, Dr. Teacott, you're up and ready. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, so you see my screen okay? That yes. Okay. Let me see the blank screen, there we go. Okay. Perfect. So um, I, as I mentioned, I'm a primatologist and I dabbled a little bit in studying chimpanzees and rhesus macaques and squirrel monkeys, um, which Hannah works with. And the first time I went to Madagascar, I was just hooked on studying lemurs. And I was inspired by the work that my advisor did and the other students in the grad program um, just sing the Madagascar's praises. And so I, I was hooked right away. And Madagascar is a really special place. It's the only place um, where, where lemurs are endemic to. And Madagascar is here off the east coast of Africa. And that yellow dot is Ranafan National Park, and that's where much of my research takes place along the eastern rainforest there. And there are 111 recognized lemur species, and that number is growing all the time. New species are, are discovered all the time, and 95% of them are threatened with extinction. So that means if you look at the top of the screen here, the, the species that are vulnerable, and endangered, or critically endangered are all threatened with extinction. So they have low population numbers, those populations are declining, and their habitats are threatened. And so here's another view of Ranafan National Park with the Namorna River running through it. And this park is a really special place. It is home to, um, as far as we know, 15 different lemur species that are really different from each other. And they range in size from this small mouse lemur that's in the top center here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, which is weighs about 50 grams or 50 paper clips to the largest lemur in that forest, that's the Milne Edwards Shifak, and they weigh about 13 pounds. And so there's enormous diversity in the park. And that leaves open the opportunity to study a lot of different things. So I study a lot of different aspects of lemurs and several of them are listed here and they're, they all intersect, I think, in really interesting ways. But there are two main threads that run through my research. And the first is that I study how environmental changes impact the behavior and the physiology of lemurs and ultimately their health. So we can use that information to better protect them. And a second thread of my research is related to that. And I study how lemurs use cooperative strategies to cope with those challenges in their environment so that they can successfully survive and reproduce. So one example of that is a really critical period in life is the first three months. And though mothers are really necessary to provide milk, other group members can help to and increase the infant's likelihood of survival. I study several different species, but I study the red-bellied lemur since my first trip to Madagascar in 2000. And they live in small family groups. And here you can see there's an adult male on the left, an adult female on the right. And in that little huddle are some other individuals too, which would be their offspring. So they live in these little monogamous groups. They're really cohesive. They're around each other all the time. They're really tightly bonded to each other. And then when the kids become near adults, then they'll leave and they'll form their own group somewhere else. 
And I do this work in Ramaphan out of a research station called Center of Bio. And the Center of Bio when, did not exist when I first started doing research there. And over the years, it's gradually um, gotten bigger and they have more and more programs. And it's a pretty amazing place that employs over 100 staff permanently. And there are administrative staff, there are people who are specialists in um, conservation education, reforestation, the various species, insects, lemurs, plants in the forest. And I'm really lucky that I get to work with a lot of these people, some of whom have been, who lived in the park before it was even a park and, and some who have been working as wildlife professionals for decades. Now, some Dr. Teacott, you said that uh, before you got there, this station didn't exist. And this seems like a fairly robust space now. Um, how does funding for something like this happen? Yeah, that's a good question, Jed. And the reason that it's happened over many, many years is because that it's a really gradual process. So it's a combination of grant funding, um, and largely this was uh, the vision of Patricia Wright at Stony Brook University. And I know she received some funding from the Packard Foundation, the National Science Foundation, various donors, universities. There's a consortium of universities that um, also play a role in Center of LBO. And um, they're also supported through programs that are run through there like study abroad. And this also helps support the community that lives around there because there are local people that are working there full time. Yeah, they're working there and they're, I mean, really they're, they're sharing their expertise with us, right? So um, here are some of the people that I work with on my various projects. And I just um, count myself very lucky to be able to to collaborate with them and um, benefit from their expertise that they've accumulated over so many years. So they've worked on lots of different species using lots of different methods. And most of what I do in the forest, I've learned through working with them. And so here are some of the guys, um, uh, research technicians that I've worked with, as well as a couple of Malagasy students. So when we do research over there, we're also working with students from the university. Uh, so Demoina here and Lango here, are some of the students that, that we've worked with. And so the research that we do also entails some training of students. So the research station is great. It's a great hub. It also has hot showers and toilets, which are really nice. But when we're actually in the forest collecting data, it's a bit away from the research station. And so we camp out. And this is Cloud. He was um, a cook. And so his, he, his job is to make sure we have clean water and food and um, everything is set in camp and he's a guardian as well. And while we're, you know, we're out during the day watching the animals and then we're living in tents out there, bathing in the river and such. So to do this work, we collect data on things in the environment as well as on the animals. So down here, Lango, it's kind of hard to see, but he's got um, measuring tape here and he's out there collecting information on the trees. And we're interested in how big the trees are, how productive they are, if they've got fruits, flowers, leaves, and then what reproductive stage the plant is in. So here you can see a red belly lemur selecting ripe fruits. And so we record that information as well. And then we also collect data on temperature and rainfall and the quality of the habitat. And we can associate all those things with the behaviors that we're collecting. So our team gets up really early in the morning and we set out looking for the groups. And the um, red belly lemurs that I study do not have collars where we can track them down like some other people do. So we just go to where we think they might be. And we, you know, after researching them for a while, we have a very a decent sense of where that might be but visibility is kind of hard. So they live high up in the trees. It is a rainforest, so it's often very misty. And these guys are in that little ball, that huddle. And so sometimes they look like moss. Sometimes I see moss and I think it's lemurs, it's not lemurs. Um, so binoculars are really useful when we're doing our work too. And then once we find them, then we have to figure out who they are. And so we look for different um, facial features and markings that help us identify them because we're really interested in specific data from specific individuals. And then we collect um, data on every single behavior they're doing all day long. And then we also collect um, whatever that they donate to us in the form of samples. And so we'll collect fecal samples and urine samples. And collecting fecal and urine samples have got to be challenging from primates that are climbing up in the trees. So Dr. Teacott, how do you do that? 
Um, yeah, fecal samples are relatively easy to collect because they poop a lot. Um, but you have to be careful that it's not all getting mixed together. You want to know who it's from. And so you can see on the bottom left here, that's Dominique and he's got some poop on a leaf there and he's searching for other bits of it. Um, and that can be really hard when it's raining too. We want to make sure it's not contaminated by urine. On the right is uh, Pierre and he's got a Frisbee under his arm and the Frisbee is what we use to collect urine samples. And that is really challenging. I have never successfully caught a urine sample. In fact, um, one person on our team caught every single sample. He was magic and teleporting through the forest, I think. Um, so it's really, really hard. And then when you collect it for the urine samples, that has to stay, that has to become frozen as quickly as possible and stay frozen until it's imported back into the United States into the lab. So it's a big so, challenge. For us. So Dr. Teacott, I got to ask, uh, catching urine with a Frisbee is definitely challenging, but it sounds, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy because a Frisbee you can get. Um, did you have any other theories of how to catch it beforehand that failed? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, so everyone came up with the idea of like, oh, I'm using an upside down umbrella and I won't go into why that won't work, but everyone suggests that. Um, so I had a whole field season where I tried out several different devices. Someone, someone did suggest a Frisbee and I thought it absolutely would not work. And so it was the last thing we tried and the only thing that worked. So I, I need to not be so stubborn. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I, I wish I was a fly on the wall in those meetings uh, where everyone was talking about their ideas of how to catch urine falling from the trees. That just sounds amazing. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> Frustrating. <laughs> Um, and then once we collect samples, we can either just bring them back to the US or we can start with fecal samples. We can start doing the extractions in the field. So on the left is a video of Madalena who is starting a fecal extraction at another field site where I work, Rindy Mate, um, where I have a project with Dr. Becca Lewis. And here she's pushing the extract through into that tiny cartridge at the end of the syringe. And that's what we'll bring back to the States. And Madalena is, um, she was an undergrad at the University of Arizona and she worked in the lab for a while. She did on her thesis in there. And then through um, funding from the National Science Foundation, she was able to go into the field with me. And so here she is in the middle using a hand crank centrifuge to spin the sample. And then on the right is um, Melanie who was a zookeeper at one point and it was a school teacher in Austin, Texas. And so she came to help on the project to then go back to her classroom and talk about her experience in the field with us. Uh, Dr. Teacott, I've got a question from one of our guests uh, asking, how long has Madagascar had a university? Oh, I don't know. I have to look that up. It's, there, been, it's been around for a little bit though? Yeah, and there are several universities as well. So the big cities um, will have some universities. And we work with students from um, mainly from the University of Antananarivo, the capital. But there is another university that's a little bit closer as well, the University of Fianar. And so, and so those students will work with us as well. All right. So um, for my dissertation work when I was a graduate student, something I'm still interested in, I was um, interested in using behavior and the hormone cortisol to understand a little bit more about the, how the environment was impacting lemurs and how they adjusted their activity and their physiology to deal with challenges in their environment. So including food scarcity and changes in temperature and rainfall. And what we found was that lemurs in the primary forest really nicely adjusted to what was going on in their environment. So their behavior changed, their hormone levels changed, they were using energy stores in the way that we like to see. In the secondary forest though, they pretty much were unchanging. So their environment around them was dynamic, it was changing, but it was less predictable. So they had really pre unpredictable changes in food availability, for example. And they pretty much didn't change their behavior, they didn't change their um, cortisol levels significantly and um, which told us that they just weren't responding the way that they should that's adaptive. And um, this was also met with a lot of infant mortality at that site. So two times as much infant mortality in that secondary forest. And so you can see here in this gif that's playing, this is deforestation over the years. And this area um, here is about, you know, oops, my cursor's not showing, about where Ramaphan is. So you can see that the forest is shrinking a little bit. But Ramaphan is a national park and it's protected. And um, so it is a, kind of a nice continuous forest that's then connected. Dr. Uh, Tika, what's, what's the main reason for the, this deforestation? Why are, why are these going away? 
Um, the largest um, impact, well, there's just deforestation like there is in the United States for several reasons. Um, there is logging that happens. There's large scale logging outside of protected areas most of the time. Um, so logging companies, there's also legal and illegal mining that happens. There um, is, uh, you know, people are exploring the forest for coal and there's slash and burn agriculture. But, you know, Madagascar is um, dealing with a lot. And so people are just trying to survive. And um, so, you know, the best solutions I think involve people and trying to figure out like how everybody can, um, you know, protect their own, their own resources, which they want to do and they know very well how to, but maybe other programs can help alleviate the pressures that they're experiencing too. And somebody was asking if you can show where Ranafon is. Um, I, I know we don't have a specific map that shows it, but just maybe on this one where that is. Around here. And at the end, I can go back to my very first slide. There is a little yellow dot on the map that kind of shows where it is. So it's a southeast-ish along that eastern escarpment, the rainforest that runs down the eastern side. Great. And then somebody is also asking, what's the difference between a primary and a secondary rainforest? Uh, yeah, that's a really good good uh, question. So in this case, I took a lot of different measurements uh, to, to quantify the differences between these sites. So you walk into the secondary forest here and it looks like really nice forest. But what we found was that the trees were not as productive. They're also, um, the trunks are a little bit smaller, so they're not as productive. The crowns are not as big, um, then the trees are shorter. So in this case, there had been a logging concession um, previously at that site. So some of the larger fruit bearing trees that bloomers like were removed. Um, there, you know, the, the secondary forest is really nice habitat for some species too, because if you're clearing out some trees that also make space for things like bamboo to grow and there are bamboo lemurs here. So bamboo lemurs could benefit from, from environments like that too. Gotcha, great question. So that's a pretty depressing um, in terms of how the environment um, and habitat disturbance is affecting them, but they have some tricks up their sleeve too. So red-bellied lemurs are really interesting to me because, well, for a lot of reasons, they're kind of weird, um, but also dads and siblings will help care for babies. And there's a lot of individual variation in that. So some help a lot and some help a little or not at all. And so we did some research looking at the type of care that they give and we collected fecal samples to look at hormones. And we're looking at the relationship between hormones that might facilitate care by dads specifically. And so we found that, that males who are expecting a baby whose, whose partner is pregnant um, have really big hormonal changes. So this is even before the baby is born. And we think that that's preparing them to be um, good caregivers later on. And then once they're interacting a lot with the infants, we see the males that have larger hormonal changes also are providing more care in some ways. And so I think it's this really dynamic, interactive social environment that impacts everyone in the group during infant development, not just the mother and what she's providing to the infant. And that can be a huge help to her. So I mentioned that we are interested in individual variation and that means being able to identify individuals. And one of our projects is taking photos of all the different faces and trying to tell them apart. And so here's a picture of Velu, who's this amazing photographer. He's one of the research techs that I work with. And he took a lot of the photos there in this presentation as well as the, the facial photos. And we worked with some computer scientists to develop an algorithm for face recognition that's um, almost, 100% um, of the time works. So it can help us make sure who we're looking at is who we think we're looking at. And now we're working with a group called Tech Court, the University of Arizona, to, to make this into an app that we can actually use in real time in the forest with or without Wi Fi access in really you know, rainy conditions, et cetera, so that we can, um, in, like I said, in real time, we know who we're watching. And this is particularly important right now because. All research in tourism has stopped. The airports are closed in Madagascar. The tour guys um, are out of work. No new research projects are going on at Center Bell Bio. No study abroad programs are coming in. And we can't get in there to monitor the animals. And so combining face recognition with camera trap systems can be really helpful. So camera traps are where you put, um, like what a lot of people have in their homes actually, like the Nest Cam. So they're motion activated. You can put them on the ground or up in the trees. 
These are photos here of red belly lemurs from up in the trees at a site near Ranmafan. Um, and we would like to do this in Ranmafan too and combine that with face recognition so we can keep, a tra keep track of who's in, in the forest and where. This can also be used to determine the abundance of species and their population density. And these are metrics that are really critical for um, determining the conservation status of species and developing conservation policies. Yeah, so you can use that information to be able to give to local government and say, there's this many species here. We've been able to prove that. We've been able to see that. Um, and then that can go into protecting that space. Um, it, I mean, that, so it's, it's really critical to know who's there and how are they utilizing that forest. Um, I love that you guys created uh, a face recognition for lemurs. I think these days, a lot of us know face recognition with our phones that just automatically identify who we are. But then that also allows, as you said, multiple people to be able to go out and collect data that you can then use. And we call those kind of citizen scientists that tourists could go out there with their app um, when they're on a vacation there and they can be able to go out and actually help you collect data and build this, this whole profile of what's going on. Um, so absolutely amazing. Now with COVID, you said everything shut down and um, that's gotta be a huge hit to the economy, to the tour operators. Uh, so, so what's something that we can do that may be able to help out from here in Tucson? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there are a few things that you could do. Um, one is to support the tourists. Um, so I'm mostly just gonna focus on the Ramafan region because I know it the best. Um, the tourist association there has started, they've adapted really, really well. So now they're doing virtual tours and they started this website, Ramafan Tours, and they provide, um, you, can, you can sign up and you can do a class where you can learn about, um, you can basically go on a day hike. So you can learn about the day active, wildlife. You can go on a night hike and learn about the night active wildlife. There's a lot of lot, um, of species that are active at night. You can do a general biodiversity course and there's also um, really cool um, opportunity to work with artists and the tour guides together and you can learn about the species that you're drawing together. So any there's teachers out there that may be an elementary or middle school or even a high school teacher, um, here's a way that you can do a virtual tour in Madagascar, like how cool is that? And there's a donate button that they can they can donate to, right? Yeah, and the donate button is um, will help the tour guide association. It can also um, help them. They're putting together like humanitarian pack aid packages. Um, they're putting food packages together to support people because they've just been out of work now for about eight months. Another thing you could do is um, <laughs> plug my own lab. So um, Leap, my lab, where um, these wonderful people also work. Um, a lot of what goes on in the lab is training of undergraduate students, working with graduate students, and sometimes bringing people into the forest, into Madagascar, and then also working with some Malagasy graduate students. So you can effectively sponsor the training of students and, um, and support their research and the different programs that we do as well. You could also contribute to the Center of Bio. So they have a Rainforest Conservation Fund as well as a COVID relief fund to support staff. And they have amazing programs. So they have a mobile health unit that's helping, um, COVID is in Madagascar, so they're helping with that. Um, they shifted their focus since researchers um, from outside Madagascar are not coming there right now and study abroad groups aren't coming. So now the staff are making soap, they're making masks, they're collecting um, moonshine to make hand sanitizer. They're um, working with a local group called Pivot that um, helps provide healthcare. And then Wise Tropics is, um, was established by Patricia Wright, who I mentioned earlier. And funds to, to that fund also go to CVB, but also other places around Madagascar. It's not just around the Fawn region. And then um, the School of Anthropology also does, has a lot of different scholarships and programs that they use to support undergrads and graduate students, their research, giving them research opportunities, um, support some of the remote work that we've shifted to doing as well. And School of Anthropology actually was, um, was really supportive of us because 
since we couldn't go to Madagascar, I had to shift focus and we couldn't go into the lab either. We had to shift focus a little bit. And so um, now we're doing a storytelling project with the tour guides and the research text at Center of Albio, where we're creating videos of them talking about their experiences and just communicating you know, the expertise that they have. And the School of Anthropology supported that. Um, and so that also that supports people in Madagascar as well as graduate students here that I'm working with. So um, Friends of Anthropology can support lots of different kinds of programs. Well, that's just amazing work that you have done, that you are doing. And I love that all of these um, ways to help are gonna directly benefit those that work in Madagascar, so, um, or at least in your LEAP lab as well. So amazing stuff. And now we get into the next part of our conversation is you have collected these samples. Um, we have feces, we have urine. Uh, what do we do with them? And in is gonna enter Dr. Ali Hayes, who is at the LEAP Lab right now in the University of Arizona. And uh, Dr. Hayes, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of talk about what do we do with these things? Uh, we can't, I mean, we, how do we take feces and urine and get some sort of data out of them? On, I mean, there's, there's a complicated process and I'm glad that we have Dr. Hayes here to kind of walk us through what do we do? Well, let's make sure I share the right screen. <clears throat> yep, we got World Lemur Day on. Okay, I'm gonna put on slideshow. Yep. And does it have uh, <laughs> does it have my slide, my side, or just the plain? I think it has your side on there because we can see the next slide. Gosh, dang it! So. A slideshow okay. view instead of maybe try a slideshow view instead of preventer presenter view or just start slideshow. Yeah, I've believe it or not, I have done this before, but I don't know why. I don't know why um, it's so, not. I, I wanted to be able to look at my slides and look right into the camera, but gotcha. Maybe it won't let me do that. Let me try. If you if you put it. If you put it on like slideshow first and then you start sharing, you can make sure you're selecting the right screen. Great idea, okay. Tips and tricks for technology here right. in the COVID era with Zoom. Uh, we are continually learning. I swear by the end of this, we are all gonna be experts in how to uh, figure all these pieces out. I did that. Um, so I put it on the... I would just try doing slideshow and then just uh, maybe start the show. I did that. There you How's go. Look? There you go. Perfect. Is that good? Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're good okay. to go. So uh, welcome to World Lemur Festival. Um, I'm Allie and I am the Clo of Leap. And I made that turn up. I made that term up. Uh, I think I made it up. It's the Chief Laboratory Officer of Leap. Well done. I like it. Thank you. So um, as Stacy talked about, she's in Madagascar. She's collecting the feces with her collaborators in the field. And then what she does is she, they sit at the campfire and while they're making s'mores and things like that, they put the feces in the aluminum foil and they dry it. So then they, so they can preserve it that way and then send it to us in Tucson. So Hopefully here we are they're drying it on two separate fires, eating some mores on one <laughs> side, drying the feces on another. I don't, I don't think we want to mix those. I don't know. That's up to Stacy to keep that secret. <laughs> there, so then, an interesting mix of socks drying over the fire, sometimes like dried meat, fecal samples, and our dinner. You are in the rainforest. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So then um, in LEAP, the Laboratory for Evolutionary Endocrinology of Primates, we have some amazing people that work there. Here's Gita. She's a, a graduate student that comes up and uses our lab. There's me. Notice Gita does not have her gloves on, but I do. So if you're out there, Gita, that's a shout out to you. And then we have some people. Here's Caitlin. She used to work in LEAP, um, but she, now she's a graduate student at ASU. And we all wear masks. Now we do. We all have our masks on. So um, 
like I said, Stacy ships us the feces in aluminum foil. It's dried. And I'm going to use testosterone, testosterone as an example of the hormone that we're interested in. So we're going to try to use a lot of cool biochemistry to pull the testosterone out of the feces, and then we measure it. So we can quantify and see how much testosterone is in the feces. So first step is we use a mortar and pestle and we grind the feces. Here's Erica. She's our chief fecal grinding officer. She's amazing. She'll be talking to you in a minute. And then she weighs out the feces on a balance. She puts it in a tube and we store that at room temperature. And now we're ready for extraction. So what is an extraction you ask? Well, an extraction basically is just a process of getting something by pulling it out. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to pull out the testosterone from the feces and we're gonna use some sweet chemistry to do that. So the first um, extraction that we do is an ethanol water extraction. <clears throat> so here's the feces, we add ethanol and water. So for you science geeks out there, that's what, the that's what the molecules look like. And then we can, so we can put the ethanol and the water in, in the tubes and we may do, I don't know. So we can process more than one sample at a time. And then um, once the, the sample has the ethanol and water in it, we vortex it. So a vortex is just something that you mix the sample up and then we centrifuge it. So we spin it down and we don't want the stuff at the bottom. We just want the stuff at the top. Um, that's called the extract. And I've reminded you here. So I put the testosterone molecule in here to remind you that's what we're, that's what we're going after. So then we take the extract to the next step. We do it another extraction. This is an ethyl acetate extraction. So we take our first uh, extract and put it in another tube. And then we add this molecule, ethyl acetate. And remember, these, if you just look at the shape of these molecules and then the shape of the testosterone uh, molecule, that there's a lot of cool chemistry happening to help pull that testosterone out of the sample. And then again, we vortex and centrifuge and we collect the extract and then we dry it in this evaporative uh, mechanism. So basically you blow air on the sample and then you heat it and it evaporates. And then we add ethanol. So it's called reconstitution. So we reconstitute the sample in ethanol and then we put a cap on that tube. So, so we don't lose the sample. We put it in the plus four or the refrigerator. And now we're almost ready for the assay. What's an assay? An assay, use an assay to determine the quantity of one or more components in a sample. And remember, we're looking for testosterone. Any questions so far? Or am I doing an amazing job and you understand it completely? You are doing an amazing job and I uh, don't have any questions yet. Everyone is saying amazing. Okay. Thanks, Jed. You're my boy. Okay, here we go. Oh, sorry. I had to, I have to do this to you guys, but I got to do a little immunology 101 so you can understand how we actually go and capture the testosterone in the and the sample. So um, this is a cartoon of an antibody. And at the, the arms, the end of the arms of the antibody, you have these things called antigens. So antibodies recognize antigens. So we're going to use the testosterone antibody to recognize the testosterone antigen in the sample. So what we do is we take the testosterone antibody and we, we, we do something called coating a plate. And so we add the testosterone to each one of these wells in a 96 well plate. And the 90, one of the wells kind of looks like this. So it would be coated with the testosterone antibody. And then we could put the sample in that and that antibody will, will capture the testosterone from our, well, in our extract. Okay, so then we take out our sample from the plus four and then we, we add our sample to the 96 well plate. We also use some controls like positive and negative controls and then we have standards. And what we do is called an enzyme immunoassay. Specifically, it's a competitive assay. So basically, this is the 96 well plate. And if the, the color is really intense, like this dark blue, that means there's a low concentration of testosterone. If the color is a little bit lighter, that means there's a high concentration of testosterone. And then we well, we put the plate in this thing called the spectrophotometer. And uh, it'll read the plate and then it'll give us some really sweet data on an Excel spreadsheet. And I give that to Stacy. 
And she basically correlates the hormone data with the behavioral data that she's collected in the field. So, the end. And if you need, if you just really dig it on this cool science and you want to ask me some questions, here's my email, h-a-y-s at arizona.edu. And I'm done. Awesome, Dr. Hayes. Love it. And, um, you know, I, I go back to my undergrad work at the University of Arizona with my biochemistry class. And I promise that if you were the teacher, I would have done much better. Uh, so what an excellent job of being able to explain the process of taking raw material down to usable data. Now, there's a lot of steps that happens through there. Um, and how, how do you come up with those steps? Like who came up with this process? Oh, oh, sorry. I'm not supposed to call Stacy the boss. I'm sorry. Stacy, the, the primary investigator, she learned all these techniques and then she brought them to her lab. Wow, what an amazing process. Now that is a lengthy process. You are trying to do several different samples. Um, you cannot just be a one person band there. Um, so you have help and in enters Erica. Erica, our CFGO, our chief fecal grinding officer. <laughs> you have been dubbed by Dr. Hayes. I love it. CFGO. Um, so Erica, what, what is your role here and kind of how did you get involved with LEAP Laboratory? Um, so during my last semester of college, uh, I started as an intern in Stacy's lab and I was trained by everybody. I was trained by Stacy and Allie and Hannah um, and some of our graduate students like Gita. Um, and so basically my main job is to process the lemur fecal samples. Um, and so I do that by grinding them and weighing them out. And right now I get to learn how to uh, use a bunch of different lab equipment like pipetting. And I'm slowly learning how to do an enzyme immunoassay through Ali. Um, I also get to learn how to use a statistical analysis program called RStudio. Um, so I can make graphs and that will help better correlate the uh, concentration of hormones to the behavior that Stacy gets to see. And so hopefully sooner or later, one day, I'll be able to go to Madagascar with Stacy and her team to be able to see the behavior side of things. Well, fingers crossed for you to get that because I think it does kind of create a full picture. Um, I know the trips that I've been able to do that are working with conservationists um, in situ in the places where these animals are, it really creates the full picture. So I'm, I'm hoping you get that opportunity also, Erica. Now, for somebody out there that is interested in getting involved, um, what do you suggest for them? I would say that the biggest thing to do is to reach out to your professors and your teachers. Um, they're, they're all lovely people. Everyone's ready to train and be good mentors. I have a really great team that I get to work with. So just ask questions and get involved. All right, thank you, Erica. Um, Dr. Teacott, I wanna bring it back to you for a moment because I wanna to try to tie in the zoo's role in conservation. Um, so how do you see the zoo as a partner with the conservation work that you guys do? Um, so I've, I have been involved with the zoo in some sense since I started working here 10 years ago. And so you guys have been really generous with your time and your space. And so students in my methods class, we always went to the zoo and were able to collect data on the animals and learn primate behavior methods. Um, and then I've also given some talks to zookeepers and docents and um, the public there too. So I feel like we have this nice relationship. And then as far as Madagascar in particular goes, um, there is um, a lot of zoo presence in Madagascar. So there are a couple of zoos that are, you know, I mentioned that new species are being discovered every day. Um, there are some folks from Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo, for example, who are responsible for a lot of those new discoveries and have some conservation education programs there, um, research sites that they've established there as well. Um, you mentioned traveling as a group to Madagascar. There's a group from Seneca Park Zoo from Rochester that comes to Ramafan every now and then. And they also have a, a Madagascar fete every year. So the, they'll um, bring back goods from Madagascar and have a big party and sell them and raise some funds. Um, there's, and then that helps with the programs that take place in Madagascar. So there's lots of different ways that the zoo, zoos can be involved in um, helping support work in Madagascar. Yeah, we really try to look at those opportunities. Um, again, not everybody gets an opportunity to go to Madagascar, but 
a lot of your undergraduate students get an opportunity where they can come to the zoo and they can study these species that you're talking about. I mean, I know in a perfect world, you would love to send all of them into the rainforest to do research, um, but the zoo really provides that opportunity. And then, as you said, as a role of funding as well, we're able to generate revenue from um, our ticket entry, from our events, from our donors, from our donations, that we get to turn around and use that for global conservation. Uh, Reed Park Zoo is involved in several conservation projects around the world, and that is due in part to our amazing community, uh, the amazing community that supports Reed Park Zoo, and not just our zoo, but zoos across the United States. Um, you mentioned Henry Doyley Zoo. Uh, there are zoos across the United States, accredited facilities that they're, one of their pillars is to be able to give back to those species that we house, that we are representing. Um, those ambassadors at our zoo are there to teach, but then also to turn around and help their wild counterparts. So um, I love being able to see the connection between conservation and the zoo world, which is gonna lead us into the zoo world um, with our very own zookeeper, Hannah. Hannah, we have two lemur species here at our zoo, here I'm not at my at the zoo, I'm at my house, but at the Reed Park Zoo. Um, and you work with both of those species. Both of them are very unique and different. Um, so why don't we start by introducing our ringtail lemurs, and um, I'll give you an opportunity to introduce our three banded brothers. Great. So yeah, we have three male ringtail lemurs here at Weed Park Zoo. They're um, Oak, Elm, and Linden. Um, they are eight and a half years old and they are all half brothers. Uh, you can see here that they are, it looks like they're munching on some pear and banana and maybe some um, lettuce. Uh, Ringtail lemurs are primarily frugivores and folivores, which means they eat fruit and leaves. So um, we really try to give them a lot of great um, fruits and vegetables in their diet um, to represent that natural um, diet they would be getting in the wild. Um, you can also see here that one of our boys is doing what we call sunbathing or um, sun basking. Um, this is something they do to um, thermoregulate. So they sit there in that um, adorable pose and they um, literally worship the sun. Um, so we try to make sure that we are um, offering them different levels to do that. It's a really important part of our, um, of our animal care. Um, like I said, these are three males, they're brothers. Um, and what's really unique about that in our group is that they are, uh, or ringtail lemur groups are traditionally uh, female dominant. So since we have three males and no females, um, it's really important for the keeper staff to um, really monitor their behavior and their social dynamics um, so that we can make sure um, we know what's going on and if there's any changing in the, um, the social hierarchy we are aware so we can um, uh, change our the, how we care for them appropriately and make sure no one is getting displaced and everyone is comfortable. Now Hannah this shot right here gives a little shot of the scent glands that are on their wrists right above their hands uh, this species will use those scent glands for something called a stink bite. Mm -hmm. So what is a stink bite? Uh, it's almost exactly as it sounds, actually. Um, so yeah, our ringtail lemurs have that little scent gland right there on their wrist, and um, that will excrete um, hormones, and that is a really important uh, mechanism they use to communicate. They do what's called scent marking, so they may um, scent mark on trees or perching to uh, mark their territory from other troops. But what they will also do, do during mating season is um, secrete some of that um, scent from their glands and then they rub their wrists along their tails. So the scent is all over their tails and then they um, effectively wave their tails at each other in a sting fight to compete for females. So um, I, I have never seen it, but it sounds um, really interesting to watch. <laughs> I love it. I love the stink fight and the ringtail lemurs. I know our guests love the lemurs, the ringtails. They are bouncing all over the place. They're typically fairly active um, and you know, just an amazing species to be able to house and to be able to teach about. So that is one of them. Now we also have 
are black and white ruffed lemurs. So the ringtail lemurs are more terrestrial on the ground. These guys are a little bit more arboreal. Why don't you talk and share? Let me try to bring up this video. Hang on. Um, tell us a little bit about our black and white ruffed lemurs. Yeah, so we have two black and white ruffed lemurs. Um, Tally, who is our female, she is about seven and a half and Junior is our male. He is 15 and a half, so um, quite the age discrepancy. Um, but like I said earlier, um, it's a, the lemurs are female dominant in their, um, in their social group. So Tally is the boss and um, she sort of decides um, how the day is going to go. She gets first pick for foraging opportunities. Um, she gets um, she gets to come over and train first, and that is totally okay because um, them knowing their uh, where they stand in their social hi hierarchy is really important for uh, maintaining those social bonds and those um, social dynamics. Um, so that's um, natural for them. Uh, and you can see here, um, it looks like this is Miss Tally, um, is doing what we called a suspensory behavior. So rough lemurs do this more than any other lemur. It's really cool to watch. I hope that our guests have been able to see this. Um, they hang from their back feet and then they use their hands to um, grab whatever, that, whatever they want. But in this case, it looks like we smeared some delicious treats and fruit on that wooden device. And so she is um, using her hands to um, pull it up and really puzzle solve. Um, so this is a really great um, cognitive exercise for us to provide with them, but also it's great physical exercise because we're providing them um, what they would opportunities to do what they would do in the wild. So um, she gets to hang from her feet. And um, in a second here, we're gonna see her um, walk upside down, which is also really fun to watch. Um, so we really wanna make sure we are providing them um, as many of those um, opportunities as possible. In a second yeah. here, we are going to show how they communicate. Um, rough lemurs have some amazing calls. Um, I'm sure guests have heard them and they can be a little bit <laughs> Yeah, so that vocalization guests here from across the zoo. And I think they are a bit shocked that that type of a noise is coming out of such a small animal. Yeah. And I can say from um, firsthand experience, it's um, even more shocking when you're right nearby. <laughs> um, it can be a little bit alarming. Um, I think sometimes guests get a little bit concerned because it's so loud and um, so alarming, but um, that's just a normal behavior for them. That's how they communicate with each other. Um, sometimes it's, um, just to let them know where they are. Sometimes it's to say there's a loud, scary um, bird overhead, uh, but yeah, that's all normal for them. Yeah, lemurs living in such a social group, they have to be able to communicate. <clears throat> and in a thick forest, the best way to do that is vocally. Uh, they can do it if they're close enough um, with facial gestures or maybe different signs, uh, but vocalizations are so important. And that's kind of where they got their name, the lemur. The Latin for lemur is ghost, and they are called the ghost of the forest because they have that kind of eerie sound that travels throughout. And we have two of them. I can only imagine if you had 30 or 50 or 80 of these rough lemurs out there vocalizing what that <laughs> might sound like coming through the forest. And you're right that they will communicate about things that are going on. Uh, maybe there's a potential predator. These guys are prey to some aerial predators. There's some hawks and eagles that will feed upon the lemurs. And so they can communicate with each other through these vocalizations on what's going on. Uh, it sounds eerie, but it is absolutely normal. I love hearing it. No matter where I'm at at the zoo, um, I can hear when the rough lemurs are vocalizing. Definitely a zoo favorite. Now, one of the big jobs that you have as a zookeeper is making sure that the species are cared for. We call that husbandry uh, with not only their diet, their training, um, but also their cognitive abilities. And we do that through training and through enrichment. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about training and enrichment of our black and white rough lemurs. Yeah, so um, here you can see me doing um, uh, 
target training, which is one of the types of training we do. Everything we do here at the zoo with all of our animals is through positive reinforcement. Um, so what that means is that, um, and you can see here, Tally has full choice and control to um, be participating with me. Um, she can choose to leave at any time, um, but um, because she gets a delicious treat while we're training, um, it's highly reinforcing. So she's gonna be there. Um, and then you can see here, Lance, one of other keepers is doing open mouth training, um, which is a great way for us to um, train them to open their mouths so we can see inside and make sure we're aware of their dentition as well. Um, I think we're gonna go back to target training again. Um, so target training is one of the most basic, but really one of the most important types of training we do at the zoo. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Um, all I do is put a stick uh, or I present a stick to Tally here and she is going to touch a part of her body. In this case, it's her nose to the end of the stick. And then when she does that, I give her a treat. Um, that's it, but it's actually really important because by um, having that relationship with her where she is willing to do that with me, um, I can uh, move her around the habitat and um, myself and the vet staff can get a really great look at her um, without necessarily doing any invasive work. And it also makes her uh, a voluntary participant in her own health care. So um, it's really important that we maintain those relationships and that um, positive reinforcement training with them. Yeah, training is so important for them. The only other way that we would be able to obtain those different behaviors or those procedures um, is to do anesthesia. Uh, so we would have to put the animal under anesthesia to obtain just looking into their mouth. Uh, and so having a protective contact, so we never go in with the animal, there's always a barrier between us and that animal, and that positive reinforcement training where it's choice-based, as you said, they get to choose if they want to participate in that, but they trust you, um, they're there for that reinforcement, we can ask them to do some amazing behaviors that help us on the medical side, on the vet side, on the zoo side, to make sure that we're giving them the best care possible. Um, now, one of the things I also want to point out, because Dr. Teacott talked about that lemurs could be susceptible to COVID-19, to the coronavirus. Um, you can see when you're in or working with them that you have all of your PPE gear on. Yeah, yeah. So um, even before COVID, uh, we have um, we had very strict um, PPE guidelines for our primates because they are um, a little bit more susceptible to zoonotic diseases with us as humans, which is a disease that we can pass back and forth to them. Um, but uh, since this pandemic, um, we've gotten even stricter. And you can see I have um, an N95 on and my gloves. Um, we step in foot baths, and um, we're really um, limiting who has access to not only them, but just their habitat space right now. Um, so it's definitely something we're thinking about. So we've got training, and now let's talk about enrichment. What is enrichment, and why do we do it? So enrichment is anything um, that we um, give to our animals to try to stimulate or bring out a natural behavior that we would see from their wild counterparts. Um, so in this case, um, in this little clip here, I am stuffing a, um, a puzzle box with some fruit and then I'm going to shove some bamboo in there. And um, what I'm hoping is that the lemurs will have to pull out that browse um, to get to the treats inside. And that's gonna stimulate what they would be doing in the wild because they're not just gonna get plates of food in the wild, right? Um, so we want to um, occu occupy their time and keep them stimulated here when they're um, in our care to make sure that um, they're utilizing their time um, the way they would be naturally. Yeah, lemurs as a primate, they're an intelligent species. So we can give them complex puzzles to be able to solve just like you, what you said, like they would find in the wild. Right. And, um, and this is cool too. You can see we have um, a pulley um, to um, help us keepers. So we're not necessarily on a ladder um, every five minutes to try to get um, those treats up high where they would be um, in the trees too, like you said, since they are ar arboreal. Um, and then here um, I am rubbing some peppermint oil on um, a piece of bamboo. And um, like we discussed earlier, scent marking is a really important um, part of communication. And it's just a really important natural behavior that um, lemurs do. So um, the idea is if I apply some 
new scents or new oils onto something and place it in their habitat, um, they're going to try to cover it up with their own scent to mark their territory. So um, guests might see some of our lemurs um, rubbing their belly, um, especially Junior really loves to scent mark. He rubs his belly and his arms all over um, logs and perches. Um, and that is um, totally natural. And it's something that they um, should be doing. Yeah, it's definitely challenging even for you guys to come up with new ideas every day to challenge each animal, especially the lemurs, mentally and physically. I mean, it's a huge part of your day. It's a huge part of your job. Now, when you're doing these enrichments, um, you know, we want the public to be able to see too and, and observe that natural behavior. So do you think about that when you're placing these, these items? Yeah, um, like you said, um, one of the most important parts of my job is to care for these animals and to make sure Tally and Junior are comfortable. But on the other side of that, uh, we want to make sure our guests are um, getting this great experience and that they're learning, right? So um, I think earlier you saw I placed that box um, right up front in front of the window. Um, oh, and there she is. It looks like she had some fun with it. Um, and we try to we try to make sure that people can see what they're doing so that when they come to the zoo, um, they can learn from them and um, they can um, enjoy those behaviors since they um, might not have the opportunity to go to Mascar Madagascar and see them. Yeah, what a great opportunity, again, for people to connect with a species that we may, they may not see in the wild. And I, I feel like the lemurs are usually up at the front. Um, they're not too shy from uh, the public, and they're almost interested in us as much as we are in them. Uh, so we can be enrichment also. The other thing that I love about this habitat is that we designed it with an opportunity for them to leave their primary habitat and go and explore into what we call a tree house. And so there are tunnels and tubes that go above the walkway, the human walkway, that the lemurs get to choose where they want to be. So um, another opportunity of enrichment, another opportunity for a choice-based decision that we are giving the animals. We do think a lot about that when one, we are choosing a species that we're gonna bring into the zoo and then when we're designing a space for them. Uh, we designed this one for an arboreal species and the black and white rough lemurs uh, definitely utilize all those spaces. Uh, so thank you for everything that you and your team are doing and to all of our amazing zookeepers and zoo professionals um, that are out there working with these different species. And uh, it's hard work, it's challenging. I absolutely know it, I did it. Um, I know what you guys go through. So well done to you and your team. Um, and now I just wanna take an opportunity to look at some of these questions here. So while I was sharing my screen, I couldn't look at any of these questions. So let me just uh, take a moment and um, go through if you do have a question, please please type it in. Um, I'll try to get to it. And uh, you know, you have again an amazing group of uh, professionals that are on right now from all different walks of life. So we'd love to hear from you, uh, Dr. Teacott. One of them was for you. Do you know the population of Madagascar? Is there a lot of people on that island? Um, there are about 26 million people in Madagascar. Madagascar um, is the fourth largest island in the world. It's pretty big. It's about the size of California or Texas. Um, so there are parts that are pretty heavily populated and parts that are very, that, that are minimally populated. And let's get into, uh, somebody is asking a little bit, I, I'm going to kind of change their question, but I hopefully I'm going to hit it here. Um, what is a lemur? Uh, we know a lemur is a primate, um, but they're not a monkey and they're not an ape. So what are they? Do they have a close relative in mainland Africa? Would anyone else like to answer that? I can answer that. Um, yes, you're right, Jed. They are not monkeys. They are not apes. Um, they are strepturines. So that's all the other primates that exist. And so they're closely related to more closely related to lorises and galagos, which some people call bush babies and pados. And those are the, um, the other primates that are in that group with them. So yeah, galagos um, live on mainland Africa, for example, in South Africa. And so they, are, they share several um, skeletal and soft tissue features and some activity behavioral traits in common with that group. Awesome. And um, we have somebody who's asking, how big is a typical lemur uh, social group? And I know that may change 
depending on what species it is. But um, for the red belly lemur, I know one that you study quite a bit, how big would you typically see um, a, a social group? So red belly lemurs are, they're the pair living. So you can just have, you might have like somebody alone for a while, but that's not typical. And so you usually have two adults and their offspring. So the group, I think the largest group I've seen is five, maybe six, but then, you know, once they get to about three or four, then they go off and find their own group. Um, but that's the cool thing about having so many lemur species is that you see everything. So there are solitary lemur species and there are lemurs that live in groups around 25 to 30 individuals. Great. Um, and this one for Dr. Hayes. Uh, we have somebody who is asking, how long does the process take from raw material to uh, your data? How long does it take to kind of do all those, uh, those steps in there? Wow. Um, well, yeah, it depends on how many samples we get. Stacey, how, how long did it take us to do, what was it, a thousand samples or something like that for the Capuchin project? Took me two years from start to finish. Was that, is that how many samples were in that cohort, Stacey? I want to say 2,000, but I don't know. It went up Let's say 2,000, because that sounds even more amazing. That's a lot. It was but, about 2,000. <laughs> you know, Hannah, because you worked, Hannah was in the lab doing some of those uh, extractions, actually. So, yeah. Well, what about just for one? So you get the sample, and then do you have to, is there time in between each of those uh, procedures? Because we saw you have to refrigerate a little bit. You have to dry some. So for the drying process, does that take like eight hours to dry it or is there a specific time period? No, that it, it depends, but that could take like five minutes to 20 minutes to dry it. Gotcha. But yeah, we've been talking about this in the lab, how we want to move forward with our next large bat batch of samples. Like, so Erica will do all the grinding and weighing and then we'll do all the extractions and then we'll do all the assays. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely a long process. I'm glad you guys, you have some help there. Uh, Thanks, and, Anna. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Anna and Erica down there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've, I mean, we've had to thank you to all of you guys that are asking these great questions and staying engaged with this. Um, we've given you a lot of information about a, a whole process from um, what is conservation? What does conservation mean? Um, how do you collect data to analyzing that data um, to how do we care for these species? Uh, so there's a lot that's going on, and I love that we were able to do this on World Lemur Day. Um, Dr. Teacott, I want to kind of close it out with you a little bit and uh, ask why? Like, what is the point? Um, you know, we get this all the time. What, why are we doing this? Why lemurs? Why do, why do we care? Why should we care about lemurs? Well, lemurs are pretty darn cute, and that means that they're pretty good ambassadors for conservation. So if you get people excited about lemurs, then that means that they might also be protecting other species that live with them, that are sympatric with them. Um, also, lemurs are really important for their environments. So they're seed dispersers and they're pollinators. They help plants reproduce. And we found that there are actually specific tree species and even tree families that rely on particular lemur species. So you remove those species, the lemur goes extinct, and that can change what's available for all the other things living in the forest as well. Yeah, definitely um, an amazing species that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think of Madagascar, I think of lemurs. I think of lemurs, I think of Madagascar, both need each other. Um, and I think that's, you know, for almost all of our species out there, uh, so many of them are threatened. There's so many challenges facing them right now. Uh, and it's really our opportunity now to step up and do something. And we do have the ability to do that. We have the power. We can change uh, some of this thing, some of these threats that are going on. Um, and we can do that through our knowledge, uh, through learning. You guys are doing that tonight. So you guys have learned a lot about lemurs and hopefully that connects you more to them. And that then turns into conservation, into us making a difference and making a change. Uh, so for all of you, all of you guests out there, I again, just wanna thank you 
for joining us for World Lemur Night, our conservation chat uh, with Reed Park Zoo and the University of Arizona Leap Laboratory. I want to thank Dr. Stacy Teacott, Dr. Ali Hayes. I want to thank Erica. I want to thank Hannah for you guys participating in this, for you taking time out of your day, out of your schedule to tell your story of what is going on. Um, I think it was so informative. I loved it so much. And for you guys out there, remember Dr. Teacock gave you some ideas on how you can help directly with uh, some of those tour guides in Madagascar or other opportunities through the University of Arizona, the LEAP Laboratory. I want to let you know that you can also help right through Reed Park Zoo. Uh, by donating to Reed Park Zoo, donating to Reed Park Zoo's conservation fund, you are helping saving wild animals in wild places all over the world. So whether or not you are a zoo member, whether or not you come to our events, whether or not you have fed a giraffe, you are helping to save species. But we can also be smart consumers. Do your research out there. Um, our ability to be able to uh, extract some of this knowledge out there is key to the success of saving species. So do your research. Don't purchase things that you know may be affecting uh, deforestation in other areas. Uh, palm oil, right now we've got Halloween tomorrow. Palm oil is a big one. Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has an amazing palm oil app that you can scan all of your candy and you can see where that candy is coming from and if those companies are practicing good behavior or good ways of, of getting that palm oil. There is uh, good farming and there is farming that needs help. And we can put our money to those companies, to those organizations that are doing well. So you have the power. It starts tonight. It starts right now. It starts with us. And I love that we were able to get on and have this chat. So I am wishing you guys all an amazing evening, uh, a happy and safe Halloween, a happy and safe rest of your year. Hopefully we see you on our next conservation chat. Look into, keep an eye on your website and your emails because we will be having more of these with different amazing conservationists, uh, just like Dr. T got. So with that, I wanna say good night and we will see you guys next time. Thank you all. Bye guys. Thanks everyone.